Morning. Uh, I heard myself running the other day, so <laughs> forgive me if I'm kind of <coughs> stumbling around the stage a little bit. Uh, it's really nice to be here, um, and it's really nice to see so many of you. It's a great crowd. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with a story. Uh, first of all, I gave a talk in Billund last week. Was anybody there? Yeah, okay. Well, that's not too many of you. Pretend that this is the first time you're hearing this, okay? <laughs> um, I, I told a story last week. I'll, I'll tell it again. Uh, about six years ago, I had a funny day. I had two, two phone calls. One really nice, one really awful. Um, the first came from a company called Danfoss. And they called and asked me if I wanted a job um, working in the district energy business. I told them yes I did, I thought that would be just fine. And about 10 minutes later my mother called me and told me she was dying. Kind of changed the mood a little bit at home. Uh, but I did what you do in these situations, I got on an airplane, I went to Canada where my mother was, and uh, I spent some time with her. And of course you don't only talk about cancer in these moments, people get curious about other things, so she asked me what I was doing and so on, I told her I'm going to go and do this new job. And I told her a little about it. I told her a little bit about district heating. She was a French literature professor, so not too well informed. And I told her how you can use waste heat from a power plant instead of burning gas, and isn't that nice? And we're sitting in this hospital room, and she said, oh, that sounds wonderful. <clears throat> My dad is kind of sitting in the room, staring out the window, as you do in these situations. He hadn't said anything for about 20 minutes. And suddenly he said, well, I don't know how great that is really, because I mean, <coughs> Surely the power plant's going to be a lot less efficient if it's operating in CHP mode. <laughs> My brother starts shouting at him about how he's a chemist and he never really understood thermodynamics properly anyway, and there's a huge family fight about this. <laughs> so finally my mother told us to shut up, and she asked me a simple question. She said, is what you're going to do going to make you proud? And I think about that a lot. And I told the people from the solar thermal industry and the research community there last week that the type of work that they were doing is one of the things that makes me very proud to do the work that I get to do. And I can say, say the same to you. I get really excited about this concept of fourth generation district heating. If you're just selling district heating as a relatively efficient way of bringing some heat into a building, well, that's one thing. But when you start talking about connecting up the energy system, about simply doing energy in a fundamentally different and better way. It's something to get excited about. It's something to be proud of. So I'm really grateful to so many of you here for doing the type of work that allows me to do something that I feel is, is, is really important. Now from there I'd like to tell a, another story which will make a funny noise. Ah, it was upside down. <laughs> I'd like to say a couple of words about um, my first uh, encounters with Wolborg University and the, the community of people uh, represented here today. I was a board member of Euroheat and Power back in 2013. I wasn't a very good board member. I never really had time to read the documents and so on before the meetings. And I got to a meeting one day. And on the agenda was a delegation from Olborg University to talk about a project they were doing with Euroheat and Power. And I don't know how well you guys remember the meeting, but it, was, it wasn't very good. Um, I sat there thinking, why is everybody being so mean to these people from Olborg University? <laughs> it was a difficult meeting. There were some differences of opinion about this and that, um, which don't seem to matter very much anymore. But one of the questions I couldn't get off my mind during the meeting is, where the hell is Olborg University anyway? <laughs> Of course, the answer is it's an old borg, but that brings the other question, where the hell's old borg? And I, I, I had to look it up. Um, I had no idea at that time um, that this group of people in front of me uh, would come to be so important in, in, in my life and my work. Uh, I had no idea why the hell one of them was Irish. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't have imagined that three years later, um, I'd be standing here having spent literally hundreds of hours talking and, and thinking about these things with these people and being inspired by, by the work that, uh, that we started together way back then. I think I was actually asked to help mediate a little bit in those 
uh, disagreements that we had at the time and, 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 and I tried my best to do that and in, in doing so we came to know each other and, and to trust each other and I mean today this, this work that we talked about back then is absolutely the, the cornerstone of everything that Euroheat and Power is trying to accomplish. Now I'll tell you a little bit about what Euroheat and Power is trying to accomplish. Um, our job has been to make a space for the district heating sector in what we broadly call the European energy transition. Uh, and uh, if we're going to do that, we should probably talk about what the European energy transition is. The fundamentals are, are quite straightforward and I'm sure pretty familiar to all of you. The basic job that we have to do is to solve these three problems at the same time. How do we get access to the energy that we need for our economy and our society? How do we avoid harmful impacts on our environment? climate change, air pollution, etc. And how do we do both of those things without destroying our economy? And every day in Brussels, we and, and, and the rest of the policy community, we wrestle with these things. And our job has been to try and make the point that district heating has enormous and largely untapped potential to contribute to solving these problems. That triangle of priorities has given rise to a series of policy measures and as usual with Brussels we start with targets. So you'll be quite familiar I'm sure with this first generation of targets. These were set back in 2007. 20% renewable energy share, 20% improvement in energy efficiency and a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas by the year 2020. We are broadly on track to meet those targets um, though I would suggest that probably there's been no greater source of emission abatement than the recession. So I think we have a long way to go. We are now talking about the 2030 targets. The exact numbers don't matter, 27%, 30%, 40%. We're still kind of arguing about them. I don't think it's particularly significant because, again, we're still talking about incremental change. This is much more serious business. And when I started working in this field, it was 2006, 10 years ago, and 2050 still sounded like science fiction. It doesn't sound like that anymore. That's 34 years. And you know, in planning and infrastructure development time, that's nothing. And we are talking about a very fundamental change. We are talking about essentially removing the CO2 emissions from our energy system. And if you look at the breakdown of the sectors, the building sector, what I think is called residential and tertiary here, it becomes particularly apparent how serious the job is. Because where we have emissions left over, they're not going to be in the buildings. They're going to be aspects of heavy industry, perhaps aspects of transport, agriculture. Our building stock needs to be CO2 free. Or all this talk about decarbonization, all this talk about this wonderful agreement in Paris last year and so on doesn't mean anything. So we either change dramatically or we've got a much, much bigger problem on our hands. Now when we talk in Brussels about energy, too often what people actually mean is electricity or what they think they mean is electricity. And people don't bother to distinguish anymore between heat, transport, electricity, the different applications. We call the whole thing energy. And actually, we're talking about an electric supergrid. And it's a problem. Because as probably everyone in this room already knows, if you break down the way that we use energy, the biggest part of it is and will be heating and cooling. And that's a problem. And why? I took this picture, it's just from, from a street down the, down the corner, or around the corner from my office in Brussels. Absolutely typical street, very nice. There's one problem. Yeah? Every single building. You see the chimney upstairs, fine, but downstairs what you don't see is a boiler, and it's burning oil or it's burning gas, with more or less no exceptions. And Brussels is typical of the rest of Belgium, and Belgium is largely typical of the rest of Europe, making exceptions for certain countries, not least Denmark. But we have 100 million fossil fuel boilers burning around the EU today. And again, if we go back to this pie, and we say half of our energy use is for heating and cooling, and we say that sector is dominated by oil and gas today, and until quite recently, I heard nothing from the Euro European Union about any sort of plan to do anything about that. So that's a problem. I mean, we can either persist with this model or we can have serious ambitions in the field of climate and energy, but we can't do both. It's not possible. And we've been trying to make that point again and again and again. 
a little look back in time. This is an old slide I found. It's one of my first presentations in this job, mid to late 2013. And I can hardly read it myself, but basically I was complaining a lot about the fact that nobody talked about heating and cooling. The EU had no interest in the heating and cooling sector. About the fact that people seem to feel that soon we wouldn't need heating and cooling anymore because we have zero energy buildings. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And about the fact that district heating was largely seen as an outdated fossil fuel based infrastructure and something we probably need to get rid of. And I concluded that we needed to do a better job of telling our story. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> because if people think that way about district heating, then this meeting, and frankly all the work that all of you are doing is pointless. If all we're doing is investing time and energy and money working on a technology which isn't going to help us in the long term. And back in 2013, there were a lot of people who felt that way. And maybe there are still some, but I believe there are fewer. If I go back to that period, and even as recently as 2014, I often went to the European Commission with this slide and told them, that this is my description of your heating and cooling policy. They didn't like that very much. And in discussing it, it would become clear that they did actually have a few ideas. Some people would say to me, oh, well, we're just going to do everything with electricity, and that's renewable anyway. OK. I, uh, found this from around that time. 2014, the European Commission published a paper on its vision for 2030. It's 20 pages or so. 25 references to electricity and not a single word about heat. And I use that to point out the, 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 the size and scale of the, of the problem. And it's really shocking. We go back again to that first picture that tells us heating, cooling is half of our energy demand and not a word about it. The next one was, well, let's just stop needing heat. We won't need heat. We'll have good buildings. The team from Oborg taught me a lot about how to deal with that question. I don't think I need to explain it to you. The fact that you arrive at a point where returns on insulation start to diminish, about the fact that we simply need to make our buildings more efficient and transform the way that we supply energy. And when I hear that, you know, I, I look at this picture, and I often show this picture. This is Paris. Tell me that in 34 years, we're not going to heat these buildings. Right, it's silly. It sounds comical. But this has been the working assumption of a lot of people. It's the only explanation for some of the policy decisions that were being taken a few years ago. And the last one, phase out district heating. This was a good idea. <laughs> I heard it a lot. District heating means coal. We don't want coal. Phase out district heating. And if that's the way you think about district heating, then phasing it out sounds like a pretty good idea. I got this picture a few years ago by Googling district heating and depressing together. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a hard thing, but we have to acknowledge that, first of all, in some places is exactly what it looks like. And that by extension, there are people for whom this is what it means. And our job has been to, to change that. I think you're familiar with this. <laughs> I don't need to talk you through it. But I like this idea that district heating's, one of its defining characteristics is this constant evolution, this constant change, whether it's bringing the temperatures down in the networks, whether it's integrating more and different uh, low carbon sources. This word gets overused, but it really is a dynamic field. And then there's this one. Now, I know. We're involved in this because when I was at Danfoss, I sat with a designer while he drew it in about five minutes with a pencil. It was amazing. This is the way that we want people to think about district heating. Simply a tool in our communities for bringing the resources from where they are locally, whether it's solar thermal or biomass or power to heat with the windmills, bringing them from where they are to where they're needed in our buildings, tying the whole energy system together. This is the Henrik Lund way, the Olborg way. And this is what we get excited about. And this is what has helped us tell a very different story from the depressing one we saw a moment ago. Now, one thing is to have a story and an idea. Another thing is to get someone to care about it. I have a dog. That's him. His name's Alan. Alan has epilepsy. So every morning, 
And every evening for 10 years now, I've been giving Alan his epilepsy medicine. And still 10 years later, every time I put the pill in, he spits it out. And I put it back in and he spits it out. I've had a lot of meetings with policy officers from the European Commission. <laughs> <laughs> They're not here, are they? <laughs> it was really frustrating at first. You go with something that makes so much sense to you, intuitively, and then intellectually, because you read and you think and you realize, yeah, of course, this is what we need to be doing. But it's when, when it's completely different from the way other people have been thinking and talking, when it is really outside of the proverbial box, it can be hard. I gave a lot of speeches. I had a lot of meetings. These guys gave a lot of speeches and had a lot of meetings. And you can see Henrik, Brian, and David. And we must have had you guys a hundred times in some rooms in Brussels, big ones and small ones, repeating, explaining, trying to help people understand. By about late 2014, they had started to swallow the medicine. This picture uh, I took with my phone in February 2015, outside one of the main buildings of the European Commission. I have a coffee mug with a picture on it. It was the first ever European Union conference on heating and cooling in the energy transition. The European Commission's initiative, importantly the European Commission's money, pulling together seven, eight hundred people into a very, very large room so we could finally talk about something that had been ignored for far too long. What were we going to do about the heating and cooling sector and how could it help us understand how to approach decarbonization of the energy system in general? Around that same time, the European Commission was preparing a communication on what it calls the energy union. Is that term familiar to people? I don't, yeah. It's a very Brussels thing. Um, we got a new series of commissioners 18 months ago. And when you get new politicians, they need to be responsible for things and take credit for things. So what they did, as far as I'm concerned, was come up with a label called energy union and put underneath that the policies which they were going to pursue anyway, which were largely already being pursued and call it something special and new. The only thing that was special and new about this energy union is that suddenly it included some very explicit references to the need to do something about the heating and cooling sector. And I'd like to give you a little insight into the way these things happen, the very sophisticated policy development processes that go on in Brussels. This is a <coughs> extract from a leaked draft of the energy union communication that I got in yeah, early 2015. Now in the weeks leading up to this, we had lots and lots of meetings with people in cabinets, with people in very senior positions in the commission trying to tell this story and say, if you want your energy union to work, you're going to have to bring us into it. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to let us help you. The culmination of all that work is somebody adding, add something about district heating in brackets. <laughs> I don't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> That took 100 hours, something like that. But they did it. And soon after, we got a European heating and cooling strategy. And I know it just looks like a piece of paper. But honestly, it is still, to me, shocking that it happened. It provides validation for the work that, that we've been doing, and, and more fundamentally, for the work that you, as a research community, have been doing. This is recognition that we have something to share and something that needs attention. Now, what does that heating and cooling strategy say? Well, it makes a number of points. Um, first of all, we get a very clear statement that heating and cooling is, are, and will remain the biggest source of energy demand in 2050. Right, so we can stop talking about the fact that we won't need to heat or cool our buildings anymore. We can just drop that. That's already a very helpful step. Second, and these are their words, not mine, current reliance on obsolete fossil fuel boilers is unsustainable. It's about time. A shift to reliance on renewable and surplus heat is both possible and necessary. <coughs> and finally, that district heating is going to have a vital role to play in all this, both in supplying low carbon heat 
and in enabling the integration of the energy system. And this is the thing, this is the essence of fourth generation district heating, isn't it? And there's another thing, the working documents behind this heat strategy, I didn't count them myself, but I'm reliably informed <laughs> that they include 27 references to Heat Roadmap Europe, 26 references to the Stratego project, and one important statement from the head of energy efficiency in the European Commission, who at a meeting last year stood up and said, the guys at Aalborg University are the best experts on heat in the world. And they don't say these kinds of things lightly. And when I think back to where we were, and myself wondering who the hell are these people from Aalborg University, that is nothing short of a revolution. <coughs> what we've been able to do together is take some of our ideas and place them into the minds of decision makers in Brussels, and I'm enormously proud of it and enormously grateful to the work that was done to make it possible. And do you remember that slide I showed you a few minutes ago with that picture? This is a European Commission slide explaining why they made the heating and cooling strategy. They're stealing my pictures. <laughs> Nobody asked me. <laughs> now, I stole this one from Google, so I'm not going to make a fuss. And even this one, I'll let it go since they've done some things to make us happy, but they're stealing our pictures, and I like that. It means they're paying attention. And they are talking openly now about how the heating and cooling sector had been neglected and fragmented and lacked a strategic vision. Uh, sound familiar? And now they say it, and it's much better when they say it, because I think they're starting to believe it was their idea. And that's fine. Let them go with it. This will make you smile. It certainly made me smile. This is a slide that the Commission was using to make presentations to national governments over the last year or so about what they were doing in the field of energy. So-called new areas, new areas, cooling, district heating, <laughs> CHP, thermal storage, waste heat and weight cold, waste cold, integrated heat planning and mapping. Probably in Denmark you'd struggle to convince people that these are new areas. But for Brussels, this is absolutely virgin territory. And what I'm starting to see is that they are proud to have discovered all of this. <laughs> and I'm in no mood to correct them. It's absolutely fine because it gives them a reason to, to, to keep working. For the researchers out there, um, Alessandro from our technology platform threw this in for me. You know, we focus very much on well, I focus, let's say, very much on the policy and regulatory side of all this. So, I mean, my basic job is to use this newfound enthusiasm for thinking about heating and cooling to obtain a more favorable regulatory framework that lets district heating do the job it's supposed to do. But it's had another um, really positive side effect. There is more and more money being put into research in the field of heating and cooling. There's still not nearly as much money as we think should be going in. There's still not nearly as, money, as much money as they spend on the power and nuclear sectors. But it's coming. And it's coming in areas that people and organizations like yours are well placed to get involved in. Low grade energy sources, more efficient networks, low temperature district heating. There is this really virtuous circle that goes on whereby interest in heat makes better policy which creates more interest in heat, which puts money into research, which allows for work to be done, which helps us deliver better district heating, which means more appetite for good policies for district heating, and so on. And I see it. There is this, uh, Sven used a few minutes ago the word movement in, 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 in conversation. And he's right. There is, a, there is a movement here. There is something happening here. And I think it comes fundamentally from, from not the fact that we're, we're great lobbyists but that we're right about this, that there's an idea here that needs attention, deserves attention, and is becoming increasingly hard to ignore. Right. Henrik tells me we're pressed for time, and I'm going to try and be brief. So let me wrap up. Heat and district heating are finally on the EU agenda. And if you haven't been trying to do this the last few years, then maybe that sounds like a detail. But I can tell you it was a struggle, and I think it matters. It's an understatement to say it wouldn't have been possible without a lot of the people in this room. We are inspired by your work. These things, they happen in Brussels, but a lot of it was conceived here. 
in a place I hadn't heard of not too many years ago. And I think that's something to be proud of. And the next thing is we still have a long way to go. Because while we've made progress, uh, we've also made plenty of enemies. There are people who don't like any of this. Some of those people just want to sell insulation. Some of those people just want to sell gas. Some of them just want to sell electricity. And we find new opponents and new arguments every week. Um, I have to apologize as well. I'm, I'm not able to stay very long today. And the reason for that is um, I need to go to Hamburg. Tomorrow morning, I'm giving a speech to the wind industry. And I can share with you the details. I had a call, a preparatory call for this um, kind of panel debate last week. And I sat quietly on the call while everyone else agreed that the future of energy was electric, everything, and that all that electricity would come from wind. And I just didn't bother arguing because uh, you know, I'm one of these phone calls and um, <clears throat> I'm the new guy and I didn't want to be difficult, but I'm going to be really difficult tomorrow. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it's going to be difficult in the coming years, but I think it's worth doing. And I'd like to wrap up by saying this, we're going to do this together. You know, I know where all the buttons are in Brussels, me and my, my, my organization, we're pretty good at all that stuff. But in the end, the depth of, of thought, the depth of understanding, uh, it needs to come from, from this community. So uh, I look forward to staying very close to all of you, to working closely alongside you, and to uh, seeing how far we can get together. Thank you very much. <laughs>